And I want to get into something today that uh, is one of the most sensitive areas of our lives, one of the most sensitive areas of extreme living, something that we've been hitting a lot because of its importance, and that's our money. I know that even gives shivers when I said some of it. Some of you got shivers. Listen, I want you to take right now, and I want you to put your hand right on Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, if you have your Bible. I want you to put your hand right on it, and I want you to close your eyes with me. And if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. We have technology. Hallelujah. We'll put it up there for you. Just put your hand on your heart. Lord, I thank you right now, God, that you make the Word come alive to us today. Lord, that you teach us your principles for your creation. Lord, the way you desire us to live, the way you've designed things to function, Lord God, so that our lives will be full. And God, I thank you that this word is getting ready to come alive in our hearts. Lord, that you are going to change us, revolutionize us, strengthen us, help us, Lord God, in every area, Lord Jesus, until we are completely saturated with your spirit. Come and teach us, Holy Spirit, right now. Lord, come and strengthen us and let us go out of here different than we came in today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're exploring all these ideas that propel us into the extreme life that God has called us to live. Amen? God didn't call you to be an average person. He called you to live above the average. Why? Because you're created in His image and He's above the average. And so I want you to look at this and I want to begin with this foundational principle. In Romans 10, 17, it says this, So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So I want you to understand where does faith come from? Hearing and hearing from the Word of God. So God's Word coming into us is where faith comes from. Faith is directly connected to the Word of God. And because of that, listen what I'm going to tell you. You will never have faith for money without the Word of God. You'll never have faith for money without the Word of God. It only comes from God's Word. In fact, you'll never have faith for anything outside of the foundation of God's Word. Because that's where all faith comes from, ultimately. So for life to work as God created it to work, it must be built on the Word of God. I want everybody to say this with me. Say, extreme giving brings extreme living. And that's what we're going to talk about today. All biblical understanding of giving begins by this foundational understanding. If you're taking notes, write this down. It's not give to get, it's give to give. The give to get message in and of itself is the worst theological foundation you could have on the idea of what giving is and why we do it. Don't misunderstand me. Why am I saying that? Because give to get stirs up selfishness and greed in people. And it skews a right principle into a wrong heart motive and God's interested in our hearts. Giving was invented by God to destroy selfishness It was invented by God to destroy greed in humanity. God doesn't need money. How many know God doesn't need money? He doesn't need anything, the Bible says. He has need of nothing, actually. So if God doesn't need money, God didn't invent giving for him. He invented giving for us. And now I'm not saying that God doesn't reward giving because he does. And I'm not saying that you can't have expectation with your giving because you can. And there are spiritual laws related to giving. I'm not trying to say any of that to you today. But what I'm saying is this. And I like to say words and phrases that if you just stopped halfway through, it would sound like something wrong and then you finish it. And I want to say it like this. God does not bless giving. He blesses giving with a right heart. Now, I want you to connect to this because God is a God of hearts, not a God of just outward behavior only. So, 
Let me put it in this illustration. I have three children. When I see my children sharing with each other, you know what it does to me? It makes me happy. You know why it makes me happy? Because their tendency is not to share with each other. Right? It's not in the nature of children to share with each other on their own. One of the earliest words out of a child's mouth is the word mine. So you knew it before I knew it. I know mama and dad dad come out early, but it's not too long before they figure out mine and begin to use that word with power. Right? It's built into the human heart. You don't have to teach a child to be bad. You have to teach a child to be good. Because there's a nature in us, we can be bad right by ourselves, just on our own. We don't need any help or teaching how to do it. So when we understand this and when we see God's principles of giving, we understand that God does give back abundantly to giving. We understand that we can expect in our giving, but our heart motive has to be that when God returns to us, He doesn't just return for us to get but he returns it so we can give again. It's give to give, not just give to get. And I have a soapbox, by the way, because when I start teaching on this or we start teaching about money, I can almost hear thoughts in in certain people's heads and I hear them out of mouth sometimes when I travel, when it comes to preachers and churches and money. And so I have a little soapbox. I have a little issue about that because I am a preacher and it's personal. So um, can I just get off for a second and get on my soapbox just for a couple of minutes and I'll get off again in a minute. But too many pastors become apologetic for preaching on giving. Too many pastors try to hide offerings or try to apologize for offerings because they don't want to offend people. They don't want to lose people. They don't want people to think about money because in all honesty, the number one human idol is our money. It's what we worship. It's, It's very sensitive to us. We don't like people messing with it. And so when we begin to come and mess with this area, which is a good thing, by the way, not a bad thing, it makes people all sensitive. And then they're like, well, pastor, they just want our money. And they want to do it. Can I tell you something? As a pastor, if I wanted to make money, I wouldn't be preaching for a living. All right? Listen, it's true. I, I've been to college a couple of times. There are things I can do if I wanted to make more. It's more than that. And interestingly enough, we don't have any complaints when we hear the astronomical figures that major sports figures and entertainers get paid. Multiple times. And what do they do for you? Besides a couple of hours on TV. You know, what do they do? Not much for your life, right? We don't have any problem forking out enormous amounts of money to the medical profession. Because of what they do for us, right? Now, we complain about it, but we still write the checks out or pay the insurance bill or whatever it is. And and, and want, you know, the government, I told you I'm getting on the soapbox for a minute. But here's the thing. If we would understand the purpose of our money in relation to the house of God, and if we would see the value of that, The Bible talks about, Jesus said, you strain at gnats and you swallow camels. And because of it, we miss the purposes of God. So that's my soapbox. And you know what? It's the church family. That's the people that are there for you when you need them. Those are the ones who are there when you lose something or lose someone or go through a crisis in your life. These are things, these, at least for my life, this is enormously valuable. For me, this is huge. This is something I don't want to live without. And that even isn't the motivation for giving. That's just my little soapbox I wanted to share with you, if that's okay. So the only reason we preach on giving, you know what? We don't apologize when we preach on prayer or when we preach on our family or relationships or when we preach on faith. But we get this idea that we have to apologize for giving. The only reason we preach on giving, just like faith and family and prayer, is to help people. It's to help people. How can you read the Bible and not preach on giving? It's the theme of the entire Bible. 
It's the verb of the Bible. It's giving. And so what Satan wants to do is come in to make motive accusations when we're talking about generosity and giving and these principles that come right out of the nature of the heart of God and turn us into people that look like the spirit of the world instead of the kingdom of God. So this is why it's so very important. And I want to move on. Now, Jesus used a word in Scripture. It actually only appears four times in the whole Bible. Once in Matthew 6 and three times in Luke chapter 16. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 16. And if you would, uh, as if you'd put this up in the New King James, I don't know if you can switch to that translation, because I want you to see this. This particular word. It's the word mammon. How many have ever heard of the word mammon? It appears four times in the Bible, one time in Matthew 6, and three times in Luke 16. And one of the verses in Luke 16 is exactly the same as the one in Matthew 6. So really, there are only two occurrences that we know of in Scripture where Jesus used this particular symbol and where he spoke about mammon but it's very important and i want you to see this today and i'm going to read this passage of scripture out of the gospel of luke chapter 16 verse 9 jesus said and i say to you make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon this is a an unusual verse i'm going to get it later we're still in the wrong translation there bro Sorry about that. We want to go to the uh, New King James. But this is kind of a weird verse when you read it. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. It's it's an interesting verse. And I'm going to explain it to you later. And it says this, so that when you fail, they, the friends, not the mammon, may receive you into an everlasting home. Now, this just seems so unusual. But let's, get, let's, let's read on for a minute. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And I want you to get a hold of this today. Because if you want more of something in your life, it's important that you be faithful with what you have. Amen? Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? True riches, by the way, in biblical symbolism is always referring to the lives of people, not to physical things on the earth. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, Jesus is saying in this teaching. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And here he says it again. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And then we have another example at the end of this teaching of Jesus confronting the religious mindset and the religious heart that tends inside of man. This idea of outward behavior versus inward motivation. So I want us to grab a hold of this scripture today, and I want you to see that mammon is a symbolic word that the Bible uses in the place of money. But it doesn't just describe money, it describes the spirit of money. Now the root of this word, mammon, actually comes from an Aramaic word, for riches, and it actually was derived from the Syrian god of riches or the Syrian god of wealth. And from that god, from that false god, came the word mammon, which means, was the Aramaic word for riches. So the Syrian god actually came out of Babylon. Now, Babylon 
that name is derived, and it, you can trace it all the way back to Genesis, to the Tower of Babel. And it's the same word in Hebrew. And it means confusion. How many remember what God did at the Tower of Babel? He confused the languages. And, and, the, and the nations begin at that point. So Babylon means confusion. Actually, Babel means confusion. And the O-N at the end of it means to sow. So it means, Babylon means to be sown into confusion. Or something that is sown in confusion. And so in the Bible, Babylon always represents the spirit of the world. It's always symbolic of the world spirit or the world system. And how many know that the system of our world is sown in confusion? It calls it and it symbolizes it with that because of its nature. If you don't believe it, just look at our government. Or any other ungodly government for, for that matter. And what you're going to find is you're going to find something that is sown into confusion. So mammon is a spirit. Mammon is a spirit that is connected to the system of the world. Mammon came out of that. When Jesus used that word to describe it, nobody had any question what he was talking about. The symbol was very clear. Mammon is a false god. Mammon is an idol. Specifically, it is a spirit that is connected with your money. Now listen very carefully. I don't want to shock you, but there is no such thing as spiritless money. All money has a spirit on it. All money has a spirit. It's either God's spirit or the spirit of mammon. Are you with me? You got real quiet on me. You were amening really well. What to go? Listen, all money has a spirit on it. And Jesus made it very clear, you cannot serve God and mammon. And he did not say this, by the way, about anything else except mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. He contrasts these two things as opposite spirits. Mammon is a controlling spirit. God wants to control your life, but guess what? Mammon wants to control your life. Let me say it another way with a mnemonic device for you. Uh, God beginning with a G. God is generous. Satan is selfish. God is generous. Satan is selfish. All human beings are born selfish by nature. We are born self-centered. But we are all born again generous with the heart and nature of God. We say that again, all people are born selfish in their nature. All human beings are primarily focused on themselves. And when we're born again, God converts that and our heart becomes, instead of selfish, we become outward focused and generous. Why do I say that? You say, well, I know a lot of people of God that are selfish. Me too. But deep inside, people of God really want to be generous. There's something in us that wants to be generous, but we remain selfish because we don't understand what God says about finances. Because people don't really preach what the Word of God talks about finances. Or we don't like to hear it or it messes with our, our, our stuff or whatever it does. So where do we learn about finances? We learn it from Visa. We learn it from commercials. We learn it from society, right? So what do we say? All money has a spirit on it, either God's spirit or the spirit of this world. The question is then, how do I get God's spirit on my money? Do you want to know how to get God's spirit on your money? Here's how you do it. The way to get God's spirit on your money is you give the first part to God and the rest is blessed. That's how you get God's spirit on your money. Come on, extreme giving, extreme living right? In other words, if I have a hundred dollars and I give the first ten dollars to God, which is something the Bible calls the tithe or one-tenth, the remaining ninety dollars now has God's spirit on it instead of the spirit of mammon. So the money in your bank account right now either has God's spirit on it or the spirit of mammon on it, one or the other. 
If you honored God with the first, it has God's spirit on it. Otherwise, it's cursed with the spirit of mammon because it's connected to the world system. And the only way to get it out of the world system is to give the first part to God. The Bible says that. Amen. And by the way, it's one way or the other. There is no purgatory in money. All right. There's no like halfway place, right? There's no financial purgatory. It's either God's spirit or the spirit of mammon. There's not kind of half and half, right? It's either that first part was given to God and it's all blessed or none of it's blessed. Jesus said this. Now, if you'll listen to me, whether you're a business owner, your personal life, if you'll listen to what I'm telling you, this is a very biblical principle of finance. It'll change your life. It's going to change your whole perspective. Not because I said it, but because it's the way God designed it. And he designed it so that our hearts would be transformed to look like his image in nature. That's really the purpose of it. So if it has the spirit of God on it, guess what? The devourer can now not touch it. And that's powerful. This means that God's spirit protects it. But God's spirit does not only protect it, but it also means that when God's spirit on it is on it, your money has more power to multiply. So if you're an investor, if you're a business owner, if, regardless of what it is or what it is, when your money has God's spirit on it, your business has God's spirit on it, your investments has God's spirit on it, guess what? Your money has the ability to multiply. Not only that, but all the other things in your life connected to you has the ability to prosper. That's not even financial. It does. It's exactly, exactly the principle of the Bible. Say extreme giving, extreme living. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. Listen to this. Mammon is looking for servants. Mammon wants to make slaves out of you. And it does for most of the world. Most governments, most people, most business people, most rich people, and most poor people are slaves to mammon. Mammon wants to rule. It tries to rule. And listen, mammon wants to take the place of God in your life. If you don't believe it, look at the major move of God and the realm of the Spirit that happens in impoverished nations versus the realm and moving of the Spirit in prosperous nations. Mammon tries to to take the place of God. You can't have both. The spirit of God and the spirit of mammon. You can have God and you can have money. But you can't have God and mammon. You hear what I'm saying to you? Mammon promises you everything that only God can give you. Mammon promises you identity. Mammon promises you security. Mammon promises you joy and happiness. Mammon promises you freedom. But mammon can't give you anything that it promises. Try it. A lot of people do. Mammon can't give you anything that it promises. Security only comes from God. Identity only comes from God. Joy only comes from God. Freedom only comes from God. How do you know anything that God's not connected to is bondage? I don't care how good it looks on the outside. And this is how mammon works in the mind of a person. It's how mammon works in the mind of a believer. Here's the thought that mammon will use in the mind of a believer. And you tell me if anybody besides me has had this thought. Either I need God to come through for me or I need someone to give me some money. Either I need God or I need some money. You know what that is? That's the spirit of mammon talking. Because what happens is... We think, well, if, if somebody gives us money, then I feel okay. We don't say it out loud, but really in our heart, we're, we're like, we're kind of okay without God now because we have money. Whole nations, including this one, have moved in that direction. That's why in politics, we're more concerned about the economy than we are about morals and spiritual things because mammon controls our country. Listen to what I'm telling you. This is going to change you. As the end times approach, the spirit of Antichrist will rule. And do you know how the spirit of Antichrist will rule dominantly? By the spirit 
of mammon. By the spirit of money. Listen, you're going to get this. The spirit of Antichrist is not going to control the world through the threat of nuclear holocaust. The spirit of Antichrist is not going to control the world through physical domination. The spirit of Antichrist will control the world according to the Bible through the restriction of buying and selling. If you don't take the mark, you can't buy or sell. It controls through that power. It's an Antichrist spirit. Because you can't serve God and mammon. They're opposite spirits. If you don't submit to the mark, you can't buy or sell. That's the spirit of mammon. And guess what? It's already at work today. Mammon dominates. It controls. It says you can't provide for your family if you don't submit to the world system. If you don't do it the world system's way, if you don't make the right decisions, get the right education, invest the right way, do the right thing, and people fall into this false trap that's empty, and they can end up either having a good financial account for themselves and still feel empty, or they just see it end up crumbling, and then they're depressed and empty. It's at work today because mammon can never provide what it promises, ever. It's empty, it's hollow, and it's false. God spoke to me this. If we didn't begin to preach more about giving and money, that we would end up being controlled and ruled by the spirit of mammon. That's why we've been preaching. That's why we're preaching this. You'll be dominated by an antichrist spirit. That, by the way, also is a spirit of fear. Which is what grips people when they start to think about those things. It's what grips people when they start to look at a crumbling economy and they're living in it. It's a spirit of fear. It's a controlling spirit. It whispers, you better watch that. You better guard that. Don't give that away. You better protect that. Bow to me. Bow to me. Bow to the almighty dollar, right? Not as almighty as it used to be. It's a spirit. It's a demon is what it is. It's a spirit that's attached to it. Money's not the problem. It's the spirit that attaches to it. It says, if I have nicer clothes, people will think better about me. If I live in a better neighborhood, people will respect me more. If I drove a nicer car, I will be happier and more successful. Here's one. How about this one? If I had more money, I could help more people. I've heard that one a lot of times. Now listen. Listen. God does want to bless us so that we can help people. But it's the blessing of God that helps us bless people, not more money. If you don't bless other people with what God has already given you, what makes you think you would do it if you had more? It's a spirit and it's a heart motive. And if the heart motive isn't working right now, getting more isn't going to change the heart motive. God has to change us so that we can bless the people around us. And I've had people, you know, just pray that God will give this so I can start helping people. Well, start helping people now, and then God will bless you. Because He blesses you to help people. So I want you to look back now at that passage we just read in Luke chapter 16. And look at that first verse that I told you was kind of a, 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 an interesting verse. And I'm going to tie this together with what we're talking about. Because Jesus said, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. That doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound like, that sounds like buying friendship or, or bribery even maybe. But that isn't what it was saying. He says that when you fail, or fail is also the same word that you use when you pass away or you die. They may receive you into an everlasting home. Here's what Jesus was saying. Take your unrighteous mammon and use it to influence people. Use it to win their souls for eternity. And when they, the souls of your friends, when you go to heaven, they will be there to welcome you. This is what Jesus was saying. He was saying, take this unrighteous mammon, this thing that has this unrighteous spirit on it, and instead of using it for yourself, use it to win people. 
Use it to influence. Use it to make friends. Use it to carry souls. Listen, in other words, you can take money and turn it into souls. That's what true riches are. It talks about a couple of verses down. You can use it directly or you can sow it into missions. You knew I was going to sneak missions into this. But the bottom line is that if you do this, when you get to heaven, there will be people that will come to you and say, I'm here because you gave. I'm here because you took me to coffee. I'm here because you invited me over for a meal. I'm here because you bought something for me. I'm here because you gave into missions. I'm here because you built an orphanage. I'm here because you established a church. That's true riches. That's the thing that breaks. It's extreme. It's how God called us to be. It's extreme giving that turns into extreme living. And so I want to take this on to the next level. Can we go to the next level? Thank you. I was going to anyway, but it's nice to know that you support me in it. Amen. It's absolutely amazing to me the attack in this generation that's coming against tithing. And the unbiblical foundation and the misunderstanding of what tithing even is. That one way or the other, it's made about something outward. And Jesus addressed the Pharisees with that at the last part of that deal. It's not about what you're doing outside, it's about your heart. Understand that tithing was designed by God fundamentally to deal with selfishness and greed in our hearts. And also to be a reminder and a sign to us that everything belongs to Him. That every time we pay a tithe, every time we give back to Him, it reminds us that everything is His. And that all our provision and all our blessing come from Him. In fact, it, there was one way that they used the tithe in the Old Testament where if you couldn't get to the place to build it, that God said to have a feast together and use your tithe to pay for the feast in celebration of Him, that He gave you everything. It was a sign. That's what it is. It, the tithe was there to reveal who or what is first in your life. And it will always reveal that. I've had all kinds of people come up with opportunities for the church. And Dad can probably tell you 10 more stories than I can through multi-level marketing and long-distance plans and everything else to bring money into the church and solve the shortage of funds we need to do the work of God. Now listen, many of those opportunities are good ones, and they work, but here's the problem. God did not design multi-level marketing business and long-distance plans to support His church. He designed tithing. That's, how, that's what he designed. Amen? So here's how much God wants us to understand the value of giving. And by the way, this stuff I'm preaching, God's had me in the dealings of this this whole year. If you've been around me, I've told you that. It's, God's had me in the dealings of this. If we never, pa here's how God wants us to value giving. That if we never passed an offering bucket... If we never collected an offering in a service, and if there was only one little box to collect your offering, and if that box was on the back side of the property we have, and if it was raining, and if you had to walk across mud to get there, you would still make sure you gave. That's how much God wants you to value tithe. God takes tithing very seriously. And I'm going to show you this. God... Let me ask you this. Does God want you to pray on your own or just pray when you come to church? Does God want you to worship on your own or just when you're in a worship service? Does God want you to make right decisions and repent even when there's not an altar call? Yes, of course. In the same way, your giving has to be something you understand whether there's an exhortation or whether there's a collection made. It's so much more than that. It's as important and valuable for you and your family as praying or witnessing or reading the Bible or anything else. It's absolutely important. I'm going to show you. Some of you pay your bills online. Let me tell you this. I believe if we really follow tithing correctly, we might 
need to, if we don't write out a check and make that first, we might need to put our tithe on as our, our part of our bill payment. Not that tithing is a bill, it's something different than that, but it's something bigger than that. That what we bring to God always happens first. Let me unpack this for you from the Bible for a minute. I'm going to give you some scriptures. Just, just jot these down. Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Right? And then it says, don't cook a young goat in its mother's milk. But we're not going to get into that part of it. All right? It says, the best, bring the best of the first fruits of the soil to the house of the Lord your God. Look at Proverbs 3 and verse 9. You don't have to turn there. We're just going to put these up for you. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now there's a type of tithe that's a first fruits offering. And I'm not going to try to teach all that for you today because it's not the purpose but I want you to get this idea of first Exodus 13 and verse 1 then the Lord spoke to Moses saying consecrate to me all the firstborn male whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel both of man and beast it is mine Look at Exodus 13 and go on down to verse 12. It says that you shall set apart the Lord to the Lord all that open the womb. That is every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have. The male shall be the Lord's. Now look at this. But every firstborn of a donkey and donkeys in the Bible. I did a study on the donkeys of the Bible about two years ago. It was wonderful. I did a study on all the donkeys of the Bible. But donkeys are actually kind of a a type of the flesh or our flesh nature, symbolically in the Bible. But it says, every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then break its neck, and all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So here's the principle. The principle comes in these two words, first fruits and firstborn, but the key word you want to know is first. This is all connected to the principle of tithing and giving. Tithing is a principle that is, by the way, all through the Bible and in the New Testament as well as the Old. Some say tithing was implemented with the law, but tithing was in the Bible long before the law was ever written. Some say, uh, you know, it, it was just something that was implemented and it's a work and it's not. Listen, don't listen to that. It's not biblical. 400 years before the law, Jacob tithed. 500 years before the law, Abraham tithed. And you know what? You can actually take tithing all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And I'll I'll, I'll just put it in a less theological idea. Let me ask you this. Was murder wrong before the law or did it become wrong when it was written in the law? It was wrong before the law. That's the correct answer. For some of you, that might be hesitating. So now as believers, come on, since we're not under the law anymore, can we murder people now? No. Well, the New Testament doesn't give a specific principle about stealing, so can we steal from people now since we're not under the law anymore? No, we can't. It's still wrong. There are underlying principles that were wrong before the law was written, and they were wrong after the law was written. There are certain principles in the law that were there before the law was written that we're supposed to follow, and after the law was written, we're still supposed to follow. Tithing is one of those principles. There are 613 laws, by the way, in the, in the Old Testament law, in the Torah. Some of those have been upgraded and they're upgraded in the New Testament. Otherwise, and some of them were changed and done away with, but a huge percentage of them are ones that we follow because they predated the law and they come after it. Tithing is one of those, and we know it. In the same way, tithing is still right. In fact, Jesus confirmed that we ought to tithe. In Matthew chapter 23 and Luke chapter 11, if you want to look it up after this message. 
He confirmed that we ought to tithe. He said he was getting onto the Pharisees. He says, you're trying to make all these little details about tithing and bringing certain amounts of spices and do it. And you're taking all this pride in doing this. And he said, you need to deal with that in your heart because that's wrong. But you should do it. And you still ought to tithe. He said, you ought to tithe. So it's important. Malachi the prophet said this about when I tithe in verse in Malachi 3 in verse 10 one of the most popular verses in the Bible on tithing it says bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this says the Lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. When will he rebuke the devourer? When his spirit is on your money. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Even from a business standpoint, that's a good deal. 10%. And it blesses everything. It secures everything. So I want you to take this and look back to the principle of first. I laid this foundation. And I'm not doing a whole teaching on tithing today. I'm wanting to bring you to a core heart element of it. On the firstborn, God said, if you have an animal and it gives birth, bring the firstborn and sacrifice it to me. Now I want you to look at this. It goes on to say, if it's a clean animal, it has to be sacrificed. If it's an unclean animal, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean animal. 1 Corinthians 10 says that everything in the Old Testament, how much is everything? Everything. Everything in the Old Testament was written as an example for us. Everything. With that in mind, were you born clean or were you born unclean? Unclean. You have to teach a child to be good or bad. You have to teach them to be good, right? Because we were born unclean. Why? Because of sin. Let me ask you this. Was Jesus born clean or unclean? He was born clean. The clean had to be sacrificed for the unclean. Did you just hear what I said? This goes back to the principle of the tithe in the Old Testament. That the clean had to be sacrificed for the unclean. That a clean animal had to be sacrificed for a donkey. The reason I'm teaching this is because there's a lot in the Old Testament that we're not relating to our lives today, even though it's there to show us something about our lives. This was a picture way back in Exodus 13 of what Jesus did for all of the human race. A traitor race who committed cosmic treason, turned our backs on him, shoved it in his face, said, this isn't good enough, we'll do it our way, and he still came and died and sacrificed for us. It's a picture of what Jesus would do for us. But that's not all. It describes not only what's clean, but it also describes what's first. And that has everything to do with the tithe. Listen to what I'm going to tell you if you don't hear anything else. Jesus was actually a type of God's tithe. Why am I telling you? Because this is why God takes tithing very, very seriously. Jesus was a type of God's tithe. How do I know? Because Romans 5, 8 says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why do I know that? Because Hebrews 6 says all of those Old Testament principles of giving and offerings were fulfilled in Jesus Christ for us. While we were there mocking him and spitting on him, turning our backs on him, doing it our way, God gave us Jesus. He gave the clean to be sacrificed for the unclean. Now apply this principle to your finances. Jesus used the term unrighteous mammon when he was teaching on it. Everything in the world system is infected with the spirit of the world. Everything, including us. So when I get paid, I get paid with unrighteous mammon in most situations. So I need to redeem the money that is unclean that comes in my hands. And when I give the first portion to God, it cleans the rest. 
When I give the first portion to God, it blesses the rest of it. God didn't say when you have ten lambs, pick one and give it to me. He said, give me the first one, even when you don't have any others yet. Why? Because that takes faith. And then I will bless what comes after it. Don't pay your bills and then give God 10% if you happen to have 10% left over. Come on, there's some of you that might be giving 10%, but you're not fully tithing because you're not giving it first. Now, I'm not wanting to get you into a legalistic mentality. This is a heart issue. But it's a heart that says the first thing that I separate out for God is my tithe. It's not let me pay the electric bill and the car payment and be careful at the grocery store so hopefully I'll have 10% left over for God. Let me tell you something. According to the Bible, God never accepts leftovers. According to the Bible, God never, at any point in the Bible, God never accepts what's second or left over. It's a universal theological impossibility in Scripture. Cain and Abel. Let me take you to this story for just a minute. Do you ever wonder why God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's? God took me to this this year, and I've taught this, and I've read this story many times, and I've explained this in, a, in about 10 different ways. And I used to think, well, Abel's sacrifice was a blood sacrifice, and Cain's sacrifice was grown out of a cursed ground. But when you read, you find there's all kinds of offerings, of grain offerings and fruit offerings that you could bring to God, and he accepted them. It wasn't just the animal versus the fruit. Look at this verse in Genesis 4.3. You don't have to turn there. Just put it up here for time's sake. Look at this. It says, and in the process of time, over time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Look at that. It says Cain brought an offering over time. Then it says in verse 4, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel in his offering. But he did not respect Cain in his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Well, God, why did I not get blessed? I brought the same thing to you. I gave the same amount. I did my obligation. Here's why. Because of God's nature and because of human nature, God cannot accept an offering that's not first. He cannot accept something that comes somewhere along the course of time. You can give it, but He can't fully accept it. You can give it, it'll still be used for His glory, but it's not blessed. God can never be second. God always must be first. Why? Because he's God. And there's a principle about tithing that many Christians don't realize. And this is when you give the first to God, the rest is redeemed. This isn't a new message. Dad's preached the same message. He calls it marked money. But when you give the first to God, the rest is redeemed. I have God's spirit on money in my bank account now. Why? Because I gave the first part to God. The spirit of mammon isn't on it. Hallelujah. What makes it better is this. I can give offerings over and above the tithe as God leads me and the spirit of mammon can't tell me what to do with it. And God can multiply it more because the offerings I give are already redeemed. It's double blessed. It's double blessed. When the children of Israel entered the promised land before they defeated Jericho, God didn't let them have any, or when they defeated Jericho, God didn't let them have anything from there. They had to bring all the silver and gold into the house of God. Why? It was the first city they conquered. It was the first one. He didn't say conquer ten cities and give me what's in one of them. He said give me the first one and the rest will be blessed. And you don't even know what's ahead. But give me the first one, 
and the rest will be blessed. In fact, the tithe is called two things in Joshua 6 and 7. It's referred to as consecrated, and it's referred to as cursed. What's the difference? What you do with it. Your money is consecrated if you give it, but it's cursed if you keep it. I'm talking about the first fruits of it. You know what God spoke to me while I was preparing this message late last night? He spoke to me that we live in what they call the first city, Pensacola. Do you know that our city is the first, or we call it the first settlement in America of non-natives, non-native people? Is this first established, this established city and settlement? Do you know that it's considered the first city in Florida? Do you know, I believe that there's a prophetic statement, at least there was last night when God started speaking to me. That God put our church here and he put us here for the nations and the purposes of the earth. And there is a connection because God likes to be first. And I'm not trying to over-spiritualize our city but because God blesses a lot of places. But I want to tell you, I really believe that was just kind of revelation for us. And I believe that God wants to bless our city because we're here. And he wants this place consecrated for his purpose. So how does it work? Let's say you do a job, and in that job, you earn $1,000 in the job. And the, the, the boss pays you in 10 $100 bills. Here's the first question. How much is the tithe? $100. Here's the second question. Which $100 is the tithe? The first one. Here's the third question. How do I know which one is first? That's good. The one that's given to me first. Here's, here's really the one that's first. The one that's first is the first one that leaves your hand. The one that's first is the first one that leaves your hand. That's the one that goes to God. That's the one. And if you think in terms of setting it apart for God, then yeah, it would be the first one that's given to you. It's the first one. Here's what the tithe is about. It's about when I say God in my heart, I recognize that everything I have is yours. It's about saying my life is yours, my family is yours, my provision are yours. And before I pay bills, before I spend on all the other demands of my life that will always be there, I'm going to give you the first because I recognize I wouldn't even have the other nine if it wasn't for you. So God, I will honor you with my first. And you have to understand that God thinks a whole lot more about tithing than we do. Because it represents his nature. It honors his position in our life. You see how tithing is much more than a spiritual obligation to keep the electric bill paid at the church? You see how this is something out of our hearts that we have to do? God even said you have to do it if you can't get to a church to do it. It's still something that has to be separated and recognized and honor Him as the first. And we recognize that all blessing that we have, all the things, all the provision, our life, our families, our breath, our health, is all because of Him. It's huge. It's huge. I heard a story about, as an illustrated parable kind of, about a wealthy man who was going on a long trip. He had a bride, and he took three of his close friends, three men, and he says, I'm going to give you each $10,000 a month. My bride has all of her needs. She has her house. You know, everything has been set for her already. But I want you to take care of her. I want each of you to give 10% of that $10,000 to my bride each month. I want you to each give her $1,000. So after a while, the wealthy man calls back to his bride. And he's like, well, the first man, he does good. He's very faithful, gives $1,000 to me every single month. What about the second guy? Well, the second guy, he, he gives me $2,000 every month. He gives me extra every month. And both of me and say, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. That's awesome. He said, what about the third guy? Well, we need to talk about the third guy. You see, the first month, the third guy brought me $800. And the second month, he brought me $400. And the third month, he didn't give me anything. 
You know what the wealthy man did? He said, I'm going to take away from the man who wasn't following my instruction to take care of my bride. I'm going to give it to the man that was giving extra. It was a parable. We preached about it in the last message called the parable of the talents. Different variation on that theme. Here's the thing. God has called us to take care of his bride. He's anointed us to take care of his bride. He's delegated us to take a piece of what he's given to us, to honor him with it, to recognize him with it, and to use it to prepare his bride in the earth. That doesn't just mean paying the electric bill. That means reaching lost people. That means going out into the highways and hedges and compelling them to come in. It means loving and serving. It means giving out of my life and my heart, not just making an obligatory tithe check. It's so much more than that. Church is his bride. And by the way, it is not okay to give the tithe to something other than the local church. That's all through the Bible, too. It's not just in Malachi 3, it's in Deuteronomy 26, it's Leviticus, it's all through the Bible. Deuteronomy 26, 2 says, Take some of the first of all the produce of the ground which you shall bring from the land the Lord your God is giving you, and put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And by the way, that's the church, not a television ministry. Nothing wrong with giving to a television ministry after your tithe. Give abundantly. You can't outgive God. You can give to the church and, and ten other ministries too, and God will still bless you abundantly. Abundantly. Tithing is not giving. Can I just say that? Tithing is returning. The Bible never uses the word give with the idea of tithing. It always uses the word bring or pay. You can't give what doesn't belong to you. You can only bring it. I used this illustration a few messages ago. I said if I went and borrowed my sister's red Mercedes, which I like to drive around sometimes when she's not looking. And she was getting ready to leave town. I'm going to borrow her Mercedes. And I'm really enjoying that car. And she comes back into the town and comes comes to me and I say, you know, Ange, I've really been praying and I really believe that the Lord wants me to give you this car. First of all, she would give me one of the looks that only she could give. Like, really? She'd say, that's my car. I know it's your car, but the Lord wants me to give it to you. You see, <laughs> you see how that works? I'm not giving it, I'm returning it. All of the things we have belong to God. We are stewards. It's all through the Bible. So let's not create theologies on why we shouldn't have to tithe because it's not in the law so we can keep our idols and be in control, which is what it's really about. Instead of letting God have control. But let's set ourselves according to not only God's pattern, not only to Scripture, but to the very heart and nature of God. To give back to Him what He's given to us. To exchange the world system and the spirit of the world on our finances and our families and our lives for the Spirit of God so that when we have it, God can bless it. And I heard Dad just breathe it on the front row earlier in the message, but the Bible says money answers all things. And it does when it's marked with the Spirit of God. So I'm closing right now. But I want you to know today that the idea of giving and tithing affects every area of your life. Every area. It affects your health. It affects your joy and your well-being. And too many Christians are under worry and fear and anxiety because they're controlled by the spirit of mammon. And God wants to break that. Some of you have been in a spirit of fear and it's the enemy that's trying to keep you in mind. You want to be generous. I know Christians want to do right. I want to do right, but I don't always do right. I always want to. You always want to. So what happens is God brings us messages like this to help our perspective look upward more than it looks outward.